Well, I'm hoping pe people are coming in now. So if y'all want to come close, I promise I, I don't spit very much when I talk. And, uh, <laughs> and it'd be a little bit more intimate. And uh, actually, I practiced um, pediatrics here in Santa Monica for almost 30 years. And thank you, uh, Lisa, for, <laughs> for that introduction. And we need to talk about toddlers, Lisa Simonian. Because I have one. I know. I two. Know. No, you have two. I have two. Two and a half. And one, and at least from my point of view, toddlers really start at about eight or nine months of age. So it's not by three, they're kind of like, you know, ready to come out of the oven. But, 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 the, but the real opportunities we have with toddlers is, is starting at eight or nine months to do lots of stuff in terms of their emotional development. And I'm going to try to mention a little bit about that um, in my, in my um, remarks today. But, uh, but I practice pediatrics for about 20 five years plus here in Santa Monica and actually started out at um, uh, Lincoln and Pier, uh, which is pretty close to here. And um, so this almost reminds me a little bit of what I would do for my um, interviews. You know, people, we've got Dr. Alan Green here today and, and Alan knows and all of you know that Nowadays, you don't just go to the doctor that your obstetrician tells you to go to. Most people end up doing an interview, meeting ahead of time, and trying to make a wise decision about who's the best fit philosophically, you know, in terms of your insurance plan, in terms of your location. And so, in my practice, um, in many practices, you do a one on one interview. Uh, in my practice, we started doing groups, and we would have six or eight couples come into the office. And so rather than just talking for 10 minutes and then next and then the next and then the next, we had a chance to really sit around and talk and find out people's concerns and, um, and have a conversation, build a relationship, really. Because um, I always felt that um, I wanted people to feel like they had gotten something for the effort they had put in to come to meet me. So even if they never chose me as their pediatrician, at least they benefited from the time that they spent coming to the office. And one of the things that would come up a lot is this thing about being normal. It's kind of like everyone wants to be normal. You know, you want to have a normal experience with childbirth, and you want to be normal parents and raising your kids, you want to have a normal kid. And uh, I, and I learned this, I love this line that I learned, which is, the only normal family is the one you don't know very well. You know, because, you know, you scratch the surface, and you find out that um, everybody's got a story. And it's much more complicated than you would think looking from the outside. Um, and as pediatricians, we have this opportunity. We're invited into your families. We're invited into your living room, into, your, into the inner sanctum of your family to hear stories that you may not share with anybody else. I mean, that's the real privilege of being a doctor. And um, nowadays, what I see is that parents think that normal means that it's like, you know, a husband and a wife, or two partners, and a child, and a dog, and a picket fence, and you know, you've got your beautifully done nursery, you know, and you've got, you're all prepared with that. And, um, and that, I have to tell you, is not normal. That is kind of, the whole concept of the nuclear family is weird beyond belief. <laughs> no one ever did this by themselves. No one ever did this job by themselves. They always had extended family. You had your aunts, your, your sisters, your grandmother, you had your next door neighbor, your next door neighbor's daughter, you had the kids in the neighborhood to help out. You had a neighborhood where you could let your kids run around without worry. Um, you had so much help. Yeah. Now, yeah, you, you, know, you had to pee at maybe, you, you know, your outhouse was not, you know, you didn't have indoor plumbing. Or you had to wash your clothes by the river. So there were some disadvantages, to be sure. But the social support that, that we used to have in our communities was enormous. So the idea that to have a nanny, or two nannies, or three nannies, which sounds like an incredible luxury today, actually is not cush at all. It's like the bare essentials. So, you know, I, I'm saying this for, for you guys just to be able to pat yourselves on the back and say, we have done an incredible job because we did it without all of the support, this extended support that human beings have depended upon for thousands of years. So that's the experiment we're all living in. And, and what I find is that nowadays, you know, parents, you guys are in many ways the most 
educated parents who have ever existed on the planet. You know more about more things than anybody else has ever known. And I mean, we're, we're drinking at the, at the internet all day long, right? We're learning from books and magazines, but I mean, the internet is kind of like, I mean, I, I think of it as drinking at a fire hydrant, really. You know, it's coming at you so fast, it's even hard to be able to manage all of that information. And, um, and ultimately, that became my job as a pediatrician, was to help filter out the information. Uh, to help people kind of separate the forest from the trees and be able to figure out what was the important stuff, what was the scare stuff that they didn't have to pay attention to, but what were those nuggets that really, you know, were important to pay attention to. Do you need to say something on it? Okay. <laughs> so, again, please come in, guys. There's this whole space over here, and I'm feeling so lonely. Nobody, nobody's... I love you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, so as a pediatrician, my job ends up being like one quarter doctoring, one quarter dealing with medicine and hospitalizations and things like that, maybe not even a quarter, and the rest of it is being a grandmother. I mean, I have become, you know, the grandmother to thousands and thousands of families <laughs> whose grandmother was in Iowa or Illinois or, or God forbid, New York. And, um, and they were away from their roots. And one of the things that you want to understand about, about modern parenting is not only are you guys smart, but you're well trained in terms of using your brain capabilities. You're well trained in school. You're well trained in work. You're well trained in problem analysis. And all of that has like nothing to do with being a parent. It doesn't. You know, Work in school is linear. You have a problem, you solve it. You have another problem, you solve it. Parenting is circular. It's 24-7. You know, it's like living in a Las Vegas casino, sort of, right? Five in the morning, five at night, it doesn't matter. You know, and if you give yourself to that as a parent, if you let go of being in control of everything, you have so much more fun, and you can live a more realistic life, because you're going to be going... Didn't I just change diapers and feed you like a few hours ago? You know, because it's gone, it's Groundhog Day. It happens over and over and over again. <laughs> so what happens then is we're prey to many myths. And you guys are prey to many myths. And you can't believe how many myths there are out there about childbirth, about raising children. And um, so, for example, there's a myth, you know, the myth of the extended fa of the nuclear family, like I mentioned to you, that we're supposed to be in these little hermetically sealed families, and we're not at all. We're supposed to have extended families. Another myth about having a baby is that when you're pregnant, you're eating for two. Have you heard that? You know, I mean, I mean, of course you are eating for two or three sometimes, um, but one of you weighs eight ounces. You know, so portion size. <laughs> becomes an important issue, you know, you can't just, uh, you know, pick out at every meal, I'm eating for two, you know. Um, and then when you have the baby, you think you're not going to look pregnant after you have the baby, and of course you look, you know, seven months pregnant after you have the baby. Um, but there are many, many, many myths that even today, even though we're smarter and better educated, are still perpetrated. So, um, one of the myths is that your baby's ready to be born when you give birth, you know, and that's what I talk about in the Happiest Baby um, DVD, which is that, and book, which is that we need a fourth trimester of caring for our kids. Because while you are like totally ready after nine, after eight months, really, let's be honest here, right? Um, your, your baby is not. By three months of age, your baby is ready to do the most important thing that a human being ever does, which is to build social relations. You smile, they smile, you coo, they coo back. They have this dynamic, we call it reciprocity, this back and forth with the child and the parent or the caregiver that creates the paradigm for every other relationship they're going to have for the rest of their lives. Because let's face it, you don't want to have a friend who doesn't know the rule of taking turns, right? I mean, it is not a fun experience. So by three months of age, your baby is already learning that. But at birth, forget it. They are fetuses outside the womb. And your job as a new parent is to be one big walking uterus, you know? So that means you have to know what it is to be in the uterus, for your baby to be in the uterus. And that's the idea then of these 
five S's, which are five ways that you imitate the baby's experience in the womb. And one of the most, one of the most shocking parts of the five S's of what life is like in the womb is the sound. Now we all think babies hear voices and, and music, and, and they do. Music and voices get through. Your baby will recognize your voice when they're born, in the first weeks of life. As a matter of fact, they did this great study where they had mothers reading a, a, a nursery story to their little fetus. And then when the baby was born, they had the mother read that nursery story to the baby, or they had another woman read the nursery story to the baby. And you know what? Those babies recognized their mother's voices. They would pay attention to their mothers in a different way than they would pay attention to another woman reading the same exact story. Um, but this mythology now extends into all sorts of issues about sleep. Um, and sleep is the number one bugaboo for new parents. It is the, we, we did a survey with Baby Center of 1,100 moms. The number one complaint was exhaustion. Um, over 50% of the parents said they were sleeping less than six hours a night. And I gotta tell you, six hours, studies show that if you're sleeping less than six hours at night, you are the equivalent of drunk. Yes, I know. You are, you know, you're bumping into walls, you're driving into walls, you know, yeah, yeah. You're putting, you know, your, your shaving cream on the toothbrush, you know, all sorts of things like that. You just do not, you're not processing information correctly. And that becomes an issue for, that involves sleep. Um, so for example, bed sharing. Bed sharing is a very big issue and, and, and there are many cultures around the world that normally share beds with their babies and so it gets confusing as a new parent. Some people will tell you it's unsafe. Some people will tell you, oh, we've been doing it for thousands of years, it's perfectly safe. But it turns out that you would never sleep with your child if you were drunk, would you? Would you knock back the tequilas and then go, no, you wouldn't, because we know not to do that with babies. But you may be drunk with exhaustion and going to bed with your baby. And studies show that even the most loving parents, while they're asleep, you know, your arm goes there, the blanket comes up over the baby's face. One study out of England showed that the, um, is it England or, Australia, or New Zealand, I forget where it was from, but anyway, that the, the covers were over the baby's face at least an hour of the nighttime on a routine basis. And, and many parents covered the baby's face with their arm or put it across the baby's body. The safest thing is to have your baby right next to your bed in a little co-sleeper or bassinet. So they're there, you can nurse them, you can care for the baby, not in a different room, right next to you, but not in the bed with you where, where accidents can occur. And tragedies happen. We now know, you all know about sleeping on the stomach, right? Baby should only sleep, I'm sorry, baby should never sleep on the stomach, should only sleep on the backs. Well, it turns out that, um, that you have much less control of that when the baby is sleeping in the bed with you. And especially when you're nursing, which is one, I mean, it's just so comfy to nurse your baby and fall asleep with them. But what happens is the baby pretty much, you fall asleep as you're nursing, the baby's on the side. And the side position is an unstable position. They tend to roll over to their stomachs more. So it's just something to be aware of. Another myth is about um, sound. People think that, you know, the baby's sleeping, everyone be quiet. But really in the womb, the sound is louder than a vacuum cleaner. And so, um, so what I recommend to families is to use white noise for the entire first year of life. <clears throat> and that white noise is used for naps and nighttime. You don't need it 24 hours a day. You shouldn't have it 24 hours a day. But to sleep in silence is not normal for a baby. It is sensory deprivation. It is like locking you in a dark closet. And it turns out, some people wrap the swab of their babies and the babies sleep great. So they think, well, my baby doesn't need the white noise. Oh yeah, your baby needs the white noise. Your baby needs the white noise to have them sleep better the first three months. And it becomes a conditioned response. It becomes like a, like a teddy bear of sound. So after two or three months, the baby just hears the sound and automatically want, they want to fall asleep. Just like you, when you put your head on your favorite pillow, or you lie in your in bed, and, or, or whatever you do to help yourself get ready for sleep. It's what we call a sleep cue. And in fact, the white noise will not only help the baby sleep better in those first months, 
It'll help them sleep through teething and growth spurts in the first cold and all these other things that tend to wake up babies um, uh, and disturb sleep in the second half of the first year. So, white noise, and, and I talk about this in this sleep book that uh, came out last year. It's called The Happiest Baby Guide to Great Sleep. And then it turns out the type of white noise you use matters. Not all white noise is the same. High pitch white noise, shh, <laughs> powerful. High pitch white noise gets your attention. Gets your attention. That's why we say to turn on vacuum cleaners and hair dryers to calm a crying baby. But it can be as annoying as hell to try to sleep with shh. So you actually want a lower pitch sound. Like, you know, we fall asleep in trains and planes and cars. That's lower pitch. Because the baby in the womb is hearing, which is the blood flow, but they're hearing it underwater. Right? So what they're hearing is more, you know, it's a low pitch rumble versus the high pitch shush. So that's not something that most people commonly understand. And like I said, the myth is that they're supposed to sleep in, in, in quiet. Um, and I'm going to tell you one more myth, and then actually I'll answer a couple of questions if there are any questions. But one more myth is about swaddling. And people, actually there are lots of myths about swaddling. But one myth is that some babies just don't like it. Have you heard that? My baby doesn't like swaddling. Well, honestly, your baby doesn't know what your baby likes at that point in time. In the womb, ah, this is how much room they have to move. They can't go out like that in the womb. They don't want to go out like that. They don't need independence. A newborn baby does not need independence. They need security. Like I like to say, the American Constitution protects freedom to bear arms, not to flail them. And so what babies need for sleep is the arms down. And this is another controversy. Some people tell you arms up. Some people say arms down. Some people say they need to have their thumbs to be able to suck on them to self-calm. Well, they don't have the coordination to do that until they're about three months of age. So when they try, they're, you know, whacking themselves in the nose more times than not. Arms down allow the babies to stay put. The arms don't come out so they're not disturbing themselves. And the arms don't come out which allows them to roll over to the stomach position. And so this myth that some babies don't like swaddling, many babies cry when you swaddle them. But then when you do the rest of the five S's, boom, then you turn on the calming reflex and they calm down. Whether it's motion, some babies are motion babies, some babies need the sound, some babies need the side stomach position, never for sleep, but for calming it's great. And then once you learn how to calm your baby, the swaddling keeps them calmer, longer, keeps them from accidentally rolling over onto the stomach. So actually, I'm involved right now. There are three states in the United States that have recently banned swaddling, banned swaddling in daycare settings around the country. And excuse me one second. I just have to turn off my alarm here. Oh, it's my wife. Hello, love. I'm just on the stage. Okay. Hello for my wife, everybody. <laughs> So I'm actually excited. I'm getting. I'm flying to New Orleans in just um, in just an hour, and um, going to speak. There's something called the American College of OBGYN. So all the obstetricians from the country gather once a year to talk, and we're using the five S's now. We have many research projects going on to prevent postpartum depression. Not wait for for women to get depressed and then diagnose and then put them on medication or things like that. But by improving sleep and reducing infant crying, we can actually reduce the incidence of women getting depressed. And men getting depressed, by the way, men get postpartum depression too. So anyway, I'm excited about getting to, getting to talk about that. But anyway, finishing up about swaddling, there are three states now, ten, uh, Texas, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania that ban swaddling in daycare settings. And I'm sure it's gonna be an issue here in California as well. It is stupid beyond belief to ban swaddling in daycare settings. The idea is that these women who basically swaddle 20 babies a day for the last 20 years are not going to be comp They can tie their shoelaces, but they can't swaddle a baby. They can be trained to do CPR, because they all have to be trained to do CPR, but they can't be trained to swaddle a baby. It's ridiculous. 
And if you go to a, a daycare setting and you're told by the daycare worker, oh, you know, honey, we can't swallow babies here. It's too dangerous. Well, then you go home and you think your pediatrician was dumb or the books you read were dumb. Do you not know it's dangerous? And then you get scared about swaddling at home. And this is a real problem because then the baby cries more and you get exhausted or you shake your baby because you're so upset. But when they're not swaddled, suddenly they can flip over to their stomachs earlier. And that is a danger for a young baby. So just be watching the, watching the news about this because if your daycare setting says we're not allowed to swallow babies, you should say to them, well, you damn well better learn how to swallow babies because they sleep better and they're safer when they're swallowed. Um, so, anyway, thank you all for, for your attention. Let me, let me see, do I have time to do one or two questions? Or two questions, I have time for two questions, yes.